Check, very good. All right, um, welcome everybody uh, to this lecture. This is going to be a lecture that's heavy on uh, all of the details about autonomous thermal machines. Uh, before I begin, to all of the people who are asking for resources uh, that I promised you last week, I will do them this afternoon, a lot of stuff came up, so you will have them this afternoon for sure. Um, yes, okay. So let's begin with uh, the machine that we were trying to construct last week. So last week we discussed two building blocks to create autonomous thermal machines. We needed some continuous quantum processes. And in particular, we did two things. We considered the process of thermalization and interaction Hamiltonians. The specific example of thermalization that we took was the, the reset one, which is the one I'm going to be using today, which is simply that you have, for a single system, you have that d rho by dt is just some rate gamma times tau minus rho, where this is the reset state, so to speak. And typically, this is taken to be a thermal state tau is e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian over z. Of course, the other version that I also discussed is that you, you can also have, this is also very valid, d rho by dt is gamma times, and then you have these two dissipators. So you have, let's call it capital gamma plus rho gamma plus dagger minus, and I'm doing this example for a qubit, but I will discuss at some point either this lecture or next what happens when you have more Oh, sorry, gamma plus dagger, gamma plus, this is a dagger, rho, plus the same thing, but with um, gamma minus instead. And so for a qubit, uh, sorry, uh, gamma thingy, let's call this gamma plus, and this one gamma minus, you have the same thing. And... Gamma plus is the jump operator taking you up for a qubit, so it takes 0 to 1. Gamma minus is the one that takes you down, so it's the opposite, 1 to 0. And you can choose any constants for gamma plus and gamma minus, but if you want this, the steady state of this to be your thermal state, then what you have to ensure is that gamma plus upon gamma minus is equal to your Gibbs ratio, so e to the minus beta e, where that's the energy gap of your qubit. So in both... So these are not the same equation because um, you can write the reset uh, thermalization equation in this form, but you will see that in addition to the, the gamma plus and the gamma minus, you will also have um, a term that is just about dephasing, so it can be written proportional to sigma z or to the 0, 0, and 1, 1 operators, depending on how you want to write it. So essentially, with respect to this equation, this one has extra fast dephasing. It decays the diag off diagonal elements even faster. But both of them have the property that if you calculate the steady state, the state you get at infinity, um, you will find that it's the thermal state. Okay? So that was thermalization. And then the other one was the interaction Hamiltonian. H int. So for our purposes, where we wanted to construct a fridge, we wanted to link this cold qubit with the room and the hot. And we knew that what we're going to get with the room and the hot is we're going to get some virtual qubit between 0, 1, and 1, 0. And we want that to couple to this one. So we make the etchant exactly in that subspace. So it is the 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 Hamiltonian, plus, of course, the omission conjugate. And you can put any constant, well, positive constant you want over there. OK, so that was that. And in the end, we wrote down a master equation for how the system evolves. And we add up all of the terms that we have. So we have that the rate of change of the system is some Lindblardian acting on the system. So this is called the Lindblad generator, or Lindblardian. So it's Lindblad generator. And then you have, in the Lindblardian generator, first you have the usual uh, unitary evolution due to the Hamiltonians. So of course you have all of the Hamiltonians. In addition to in the interaction, you have the Hamiltonian of the cold, Hamiltonian of the room, Hamiltonian of the hot. And then you have all of the dissipators that we have there. And each dissipator, I'm using the reset version, so each dissipator is of the form. Um, you replace that particular state. So mx on rho, you trace out the x state, and you replace it with a the thermal state. OK. Now, 
There are a few things before we study how this uh, system behaves. There are a few things that I want to um, talk about with the master equation. So the whole goal of um, doing autonomous thermal machines is, of course, in the word autonomous, which is that they should work without us having to intervene and to provide resources once they begin. And so this has two components. So the first thing is that it's closed. So now the entirety of the system is described by um, a time-independent generator. So this Limblad generator does not depend on time. Uh, that will work indefinitely as long as I allow it to run. Okay, so this, so this has already, already been taken care of by saying we have a time-independent Lindblad or Lindbladian. But the other thing I would like it to be, and this is also consistent with being closed, is that the, it is um, energy is preserved. And what does this mean? Well, what I've done now, um, if I consider what was happening with the system before I had the interaction Hamiltonian, then I could consider, well, if I don't have any interaction, this is just going to be thermal, this is going to be thermal, this is going to be thermal. Once I switch on the interaction, I'm going to have excitations exchange. In particular, every time the room goes down, the cold and the hot gain an energy, for example. So now the point is, well, if I have such an interaction Hamiltonian, in general, if I, if I just choose an arbitrary one, I will end up feeding the system with energy or taking out energy from the system. The only time when I don't exchange energy as a result of this interaction Hamiltonian is when this one does not change the energy of, of those states. And that's going to happen only when, so H int is energy preserving if and only if the two things, two ways I can put it, I can say H int commutes with the sum of the Hamiltonians that were there in the first place, HC, HH. H. Okay? So this means when H int acts, it actually doesn't change the sum of the energies of the, of the system. And in this particular case, because you have qubits, this is um, equivalent to just saying that the energy of the 1, 0, 1 state is equal to the energy of the 0, 1, 0 state, which in turn is the same as saying that ER is equal to EC plus EH. Okay. So quite simply, whenever the room loses an excitation to cold or hot or vice versa, the total energy doesn't change because these sums have been chosen to be equal. Okay. This is also... By the way, this, the same as saying that um, if you considered now, you could look at this as this, the cold qubit connected to the virtual qubit from here, and it would be the same as saying that that gap of the cold qubit is exactly the same as the gap uh, of the virtual qubit that you have here. Because the gap of the virtual qubit here is E room minus E hot, and E room minus E hot being E cold is exactly the same as this equation. Okay, so the thing is, even though we considered with the qubit swap the general case of, you know, you could swap any two qubits. When we do thermodynamics, because of the fact that we're keeping track with energy, all, almost all of the time we will be at least, well, in autonomous thermal machines, we will always be putting in interaction Hamiltonians between degenerate states or degenerate gaps. And the reason is if you don't do this, then you essentially have to account for the field that is implementing this interaction Hamiltonian. Okay. Now, let's continue. Right, so the next thing to talk about is the interaction picture. Now, the, why, why am I talking about the interaction picture? The reason is because what we would like to do is actually not have to keep track of the Hamiltonians of the... Um, C, R, and H on their own. So you know about, let's, the, um, you have the Schrodinger picture. So actually, how, how familiar are people with the phrase, the interaction picture? You are right. OK, so just to briefly say, so you have the Schrodinger picture where you go, I, I take the, I evolve the state. So the state evolves in time t. Then you have the Heisenberg picture where you keep Heisenberg picture where you actually don't evolve the state, but you evolve the observables with T. And finally, the interaction picture, 
Where you do something in between, you sort of take, you absorb, I would say, some of the observables, so absorb some Hamiltonians, H, and keep sort of the rest. Now, the reason that this is useful for us is because of the following property. So when we look at the, um, the evolution of these, uh, these things, I can split it into two things. I can split it into the evolution due to the natural Hamiltonian, so the one that you have just HC, HR, and HH, and then the, the H interaction and the, the dissipator terms. And the point is I'm not going to do this in detail, but these two things, they commute. Because all, all that HC, HR, and HH do is they add phases. So it, when I'm looking in the energy basis of these three qubits, all they do is they add phases on the off-diagonal terms. So what one can do is one can always in, evolve the state due to just H int and the dissipators, and then after time t, just go, well, what are the phases that will be put by this on the top? And we put them. The reason that this works is because the natural Hamiltonian commutes with H int, and you can then check that this works also because these things, the, the action of this commutes with the action of the dissipators. The dissipators just decay the, the diagonal terms, whereas the Hamiltonians, they simply um, rotate the off-diagonal terms. So the result of this is that what we do is we absorb, so for us, for thermal machines, As long as the interaction Hamiltonian, so if H int commutes with what I would call H naught, so for us H naught is just the sum, but this is a more general statement, then what you do is you just absorb H naught into the interaction picture. So H naught and keep H int. So the master equation that we effectively work in work with um, is then one that does not actually need to have HC, HR, and HH. Okay. Okay. Um, another final thing, and this is this is the part which has loads of theory and research in it um, that one can get into, is the relationship between so, let's say the uh, amplitudes or the well, yeah, the strength, let's say, of H int and dissipators versus H naught. So as I've written it down, I haven't said anything about how large or small any of those operators have been. I've just said, oh, you can just add all of these things. But the fact is that when you, so remember when you derive a Limbladen, the way you do it is you start from the evolution of the whole thing, and then you reduce it and you say, well, if I make all of the approximations, then I will get this master equation. And this is not going to work um, always, especially, it's not going to give us that unless some conditions are satisfied. So in addition to the conditions I talked about last time, which were more about the environment has to be well behaved, the correlation should go away fast, etc. There are also other properties. So first of all, H int should be much less than H naught. And the reason is that, so when I talk about the dissipator, for example, uh, where one bath replaces a qubit to the thermal state, this sort of works on the fact that the bath is connected to the qubit. So the, the Hamiltonian that the bath interacts with is the Hamiltonian of the qubit. But if I actually look at this system, the entire Hamiltonian is the sum of the natural ones plus H int. So if H int becomes very large, then it begins to actually be a big factor in the Hamiltonian. So then if I was to say, what are the uh, eigenstates of, of this system, they will change as H int increases because they will basically form a splitting between the... Um, the states 101 and 010 will be split by the, the influence of H int. And so eventually, actually, when H naught is large enough, sorry, when H int is large enough, you cannot actually look at thermalization as acting bath to the qubit is connected to, but rather bath to the global thing. So it will still work by doing jumps on the system, but has to, the, the jump operators will change depending on the global Hamiltonian. So this is one thing. And then the other thing is also that the dissipators have to be much less in magnitude. And this is like a very, I mean, I, there are no operators here, but I just mean that the strength of these interactions has to be much less than H naught. What is the reason for this? The reason for this is because, so when we considered last time this picture of thermalization, so we had the system and we had the environment, and then we wanted to find, our goal was to say, oh, uh, we can argue that the system tau S, if you consider energy conservation, is approximately a Gibbs state, beta HS, upon z. Now, the Hamiltonian of this whole thing is, I can write it as hs plus he plus h 
SE in general, some natural Hamiltonian and system, environment, and an interaction thing, right? But the point again is here we have the same problem. If, if H SE is small enough, then somehow the local energy dynamics of this is essentially that of the Hamiltonian of the system. So when I consider, oh, it's in a thermal state, it will be in a thermal state versus its own dynamics, and its own dynamics are HS. But if HSE is extremely large, or it may be not even large, but if HS is zero, for example, and the only dynamics of, on S are, are affected by an interaction, then, of course, the, the thermal state or the equilibrated state I'm going to get is going to depend more on HSE than it's going to depend on its own dynamics. So here as well, you have the thing that when we consider thermalization, there has to be an interaction, but the, if the interaction is large enough, then there's no sense, a sense of a local system is now washed away because it, the interaction is strong enough that we have to actually consider it together. Its dynamics are not that it's of its own. Um, it, its dynamics are affected more by the, by the interaction than its own thing. Okay? So you have all of these regimes. And, and depending on, so the, the way things change is sometimes you can take away uh, some of these and you get a different master equation. Sometimes you take away some of these and you will not get a master equation. And re regardless of the regime you work, the things that you conclude about the, about the system, so for example, the heat flow and, and things like this, they would be affected by the regime you work with. So now we are going to work in a very simple one where essentially H0 is dominant, so it is very big, and all of these are essentially perturbations to it. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 But so what I mean with with dissipators, I mean if if we if we derive what this dissipator is, we would derive it starting from this. And so where does the dissipator come? It would come from here. So the the strength of the dissipator would be proportional to the strength of this Hamiltonian. But if the strength of this Hamiltonian is too large, then when I start from this picture and I try to get there, I will not get a clean description of, oh, it just takes the state to the thermal state with respect to HS, because now this is dominating HS. So it will, it will take it, equally equilibrate it to some state, but that state will be more complicated. It will not depend only on HS. They are, in, indeed, yes, they are very similar, indeed. They, bo they both come from the fact that if you have an interaction term that is too large, it begins to change the, the local Hamiltonians that you use to argue that, oh, you could, you could simply look at the local Hamiltonian when talking about thermalization and the this state. One, this one. Yeah, the second one, the uh, have this yeah. Yeah, so... So, yeah. so, one, so for example, one regime where you, you, you satisfy this but you don't satisfy this is where h int is actually comparable to h naught. And then in that case, but the dissipator, so the Hamilton in SE is small enough. So then what happens is you get dissipators nicely, but they thermalize you to the, the jump operators in them will not be dependent on just h naught. They will be dependent on h naught plus h int. So they will change. So you still get... Because your interaction between system and environment, so system and the parts, is, is small enough, you still have a clean thermalization master equation. But the thermalization one itself will change. It will not be one that's only dependent on local Hamiltonians, but rather on all three qubits, including the interaction. So you could have this one, but not that one. Yeah, so, this, so there, is, um, uh, there, there is entire literature that's based on the local versus the global master equation. Local meaning that, oh, the interaction between the components of the machine, so this is the first part, are small enough such that the bath C have only the local Hamiltonians, whereas the global one is, oh, they have to react to the entirety. Okay, very good. So that concludes our, say, simplistic description of the, the ingredients and the considerations that go into constructing the Limbladian. Uh, so now before I look at the, the machine itself, let me first define something very similar, talk about something very simple. What is the heat flow in, in the machine? Okay. 
So one thing I can do is I can simply go, well, what is the rate of change of, of the um, energy of the system? And actually, this is, this is now something interesting, because I should also say that usually in thermodynamics, our the way we look at it is that you have systems with their own energies, and then your interaction is done for the purpose of doing some, like, affecting some state change. So when you consider a before and an after picture of like what was the energy before, what is the energy after, you only consider the Hamiltonians without the interaction because you, the interaction is something you switch on and you switch off. It's not something that's permanent. So when, we, when, when I want to consider what is the, um, let's say, the rate of change of the energies of, the, of any of the qubits, I will consider it with respect to the local, the Hamiltonians that it has regard, um, independent of the interaction Hamiltonian. Okay, but let me now calculate this. Uh, yeah, that's the one. So heat flow. So first I will just go, what is the rate of change? So D of E average by DT. And so this, I simply now go, it's because of linearity, I can switch in. So E average is, of course, trace of the full Hamiltonian times that. So I can now switch this in and say this is now trace of HC plus HR plus HH. Uh, comma d by dt of rho. Okay, so this is what I mean now by I, I only take the the Hamiltonians corresponding to after I finish with the machine and I switch it off. How have the energies changed? It's the local one, and this is also consistent with the fact that I'm taking h int much less than h naught. So in any case, even if I added h int here, it would be a perturbative term. Okay, uh, what is this going to be? Here is where our commutation relation comes in handy. The first term in the, in the rate of change has the commutator of h naught uh, and h int. So that's going to be 0 because trace of, so first of all, trace of x uh, times x comma rho is clearly 0. And trace of, yeah, x, well, trace of x y rho is 0 as long as x commutes with y. So when I do the sum of the Hamiltonians on the sum of the Hamiltonians, of course, that's fine. And the sum of the Hamiltonians on h int, that's also fine. So that first thing completely vanishes. So what we see is that the only reason that the energy changes is from the other terms. So we have um, sum over x. In, uh, I'm not going to write the full set because we know what x is now. So this is uh, trace of hc plus hr plus H H acting on M X rho um, minus rho, and I have to put in. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't put in a, a gamma there, so I should put in a gamma there. Sorry. There's always a gamma X here because you can have a strength of the interaction. So that's also going to be here. So it's going to be gamma x. OK. Um, and now the thing is, um, the nice thing about this map is what the map does is it keeps the reduced state on everything other than x the same. Right? So you have, if you have the cold, the room, and the hot, and you are, for example, let x be cold, then mx, mc on rho is just going to keep room and hot the same and only change the state on c. So when you actually do this with respect to the trace and stuff, what you find is that you end up with only um, trace of that particular Hamiltonian times tau x, which is the final, which gives you the final energy of that particular component, minus trace of, well, everything else. So, well, let me write it as rho x. So... When you trace over everything other than x, you will get 0 here. And the only thing that's uh, not 0 is the one with x, because there you've replaced it by tau here. And here it's the original. This is the reduced state. So rho x is equal to trace over, well, y, z of rho. y, comma z not equal to x, basically. Trace over the every everything else. Is there a way to write trace over everything else? That's neater than this? I'm not sure. But yeah, it's trace over everything else. Okay, um, and what we can call this, so 
I'm going to call this or define this as, let's see, this is the energy chase or heat from the bath. So let's use it, uh, let's call it QX. Okay. So this is now, because I've defined it this way, it's heat from bath or heat, heat flow, heat flow from bath. Okay. Good. Let's do some erasing. Uh, any questions? Right. Okay, so we have 10 minutes before we take a break. So we have all of the Limbladian, we define heat flow, everything. So now we have to consider what act actually happens to the state. So when I have d rho by dt is equal to L rho, and L, as you can verify from that, this is a linear operator. Uh, linear operation on rho, okay? So even though it's written like rho is a matrix and L is a, it's an operator, it is a linear operation. Um, and so if you actually were to solve this, this will give you that rho is going to be e to the L times t on rho zero, whatever the initial state was. So this is just your normal linear operation, um, sorry, normal solution to a differential equation. Okay, so there are two things now we can look at, one of which will be more important to us. So the transient state is when we actually look at T finite. And then we look at the asymptotics, which is where T is going to infinity. Okay. And in particular, in the asymptotics, we ask the question, is there a steady state? So a steady state is a state where rho goes to, the density matrix goes to, and, and stays there as t goes to infinity. And this is not always the case. So for example, one obvious example when there's no steady state is if I just had just a Hamiltonian and no dissipators. Then there's no steady state because rho will just keep rotating and you will have oscillations that go on for infinity, so you will not have a steady state. Okay, um, a little bit of sort of theory on this. So if you look at the Limbladian as a linear operator, so you can, you can write as a linear operator, you can do sort of the, um, you can look at its eigenvalues, for example. So L is, has eigenvalues. So eigenvalues that are in general imaginary. Sorry, not imaginary, complex. What did I say? Uh, complex. So in general, L can have complex eigenvalues, but the real part is always less or equal to zero. This kind of follows from the fact that if you, if you look at this exponential um, and you, if you have any positive eigenvalues here, you're going to have a blowing up solution, which is not the case. States are all, always remain normalized. So your eigenvalues always have real part less or equal to zero. So when you have the real part zero, so the real of lambda is equal to zero, then you have two options. One is that imaginary of lambda is also equal to zero. So it's just a zero eigenvalue. And that is a steady state. So steady state and the, um, the eigen matrix, so basically the matrix that you put in there, which is, which is uh, a solution to the eigenvalue equation, is a density matrix. Now, why do I say it is? Because this is not the case in general. So one of the things about L is it's not as well behaved as things you're used to in quantum mechanics. So for example, it, it need not be Hermitian, it need not be diagonalizable, so it, its eigenmatrices are in general not very well behaved. But when you have um, steady state um, 
uh, an eigenvalue zero, then the steady state of that, that eigenmatrix is a density matrix. So this is the one where you go L rho, I can call it rho infinity, is equal to zero. Okay? And of course, because L rho infinity is zero, it means that d by dt, the rate of change of rho infinity is zero, so this is a steady state by definition. You can also have that imaginary of lambda is not equal to zero. So this is a purely imaginary eigenvalue. And then you don't have a steady state, but what you have is um, uh, non-decaying. subspace. And this is a subspace in which you don't have any decay out. So if once you get into that subspace, you will remain there. You're not going to decay in any way. But within that subspace, you can actually have unitary uh, evolution. So you will rotate and you will oscillate. This always comes in pairs. That's an important thing. So so if you ever have um, uh, well, actually, all of the eigenvalues of L come in pairs. So every time you have a complex eigenvalue, you're going to have the conjugate eigenvalue there. And the reason for that is because, well, L is acting on a positive density matrix and keeps it Hermitian and stuff. So you always have uh, pairs like that. OK, so you have a non-decaying subspace there. Um, so it's actually, if you wanted to play around with stuff like this, they are very simple examples. So for instance, so example one is, um, you just take a qubit, and you take a dissipator with the jump operator to be, let's say, 0, 1. So it's a single uh, Limbladin with just a single dissipator. So when I say jump operator uh, this way, I mean you're going to, the Limbladin is going to be this of L dagger L comma rho. And so this is very clear. There's, there's no unitary evolution. There's just dissipation to the state 0. So when you look at the eigenvalues of this Limbladin, you're going to have that there is a steady state. And there's not going to be any imaginary past of the eigenvalues. Then there's an example two where you can take, um, let's say, a Qtrit and uh, imagine that you have a dissipator uh, L going from zero to one. Oh, so let's say let's put it from let's two to uh, zero. So from the highest state to the lower state. But you also, and, and you have a Hamiltonian, let's say, 1, 0, 0, 1, um, plus the Hermitian conjugate. No, not 1, 0, 0, 1. What am, I, what am I saying? This is not a Hamiltonian of a single system. I want to say the sigma x Hamiltonian in that. So it's, uh, it's yeah, 1, 0, plus 0, 1. So this will be an example where you, you're going to have decaying eigenvalues because you have a space 2 that will move, you move out of, so you will go to 0. But within 0 and 1, you have a non-decaying subspace because there's no decay out of that. So you, you're, you're not going to have a steady state. Rather, you'll have uh, things that are in here. So you can always, I mean, just with Qtris, you can generate any and all of these examples to, to sort of um, go through all of the ways that the Limblad can uh, behave. OK, uh, right, are there any questions? None? All right, so then we, let's proceed, 1018. So um, the transient state is typically in, in thermal machines not as looked at as the asymptotics, and the reason being that what you really want when you, when you turn on these thermal machines is that you want them to reach a, a state of operation where they are somehow now constant. So this is some of the same thing that you think about. When you turn on an engine, there's this one brief second where you hear co a complicated thing corresponding to the engine turning on. But then after that, it's just now. It's just in a constant state of rotation. So it's basically already very quickly in its asymptotic state of operation. Of course, it's not as fixed one because you can increase, change the gear. You can increase the, the flow of fuel and stuff like that. But the engine itself has already reached a state at which um, it will be for until you turn it off. And so with thermal states, with thermal machines, typically what we are interested in is looking at the asymptotic state of operation because that's where we want to see whether the, we have in that place cooling or heating or whatever it is that we are aiming for. So 
Typically, when we construct thermal machines, especially when it's of qubits like this, you are going to have a steady state um, without any decaying, well, without any, um, let's say, non-decaying subspaces. And the reason being that, so one of the easiest ways to ensure that you don't have this non-decaying subspace where you have unitary evolution all the way to t going to infinity is to ensure that every state is touched by some sort of decay me mechanism. And this is the case here because the sum of the three decaying mechanisms on cold, room, and hot ensure that every, basically every eigenstate is, is affected by that. Like every eigenstate has a jump to another one. And because every eigenstate has a jump to the other one, it means that all of the off-diagonal terms are sort of taken towards zero by, by, those, uh, by that interaction, by those dissipators. So, so let's now look at solving for the steady state. State. So you're basically solving the equation L rho is equal to or L rho infinity is equal to zero. And that gives you what rho infinity is. And there are, I would say, two things that I'm used to seeing uh, as ways of solving this. So the first is just as a set of linear equations. So one of the things you can do is, for example, you can program this. You can say, well, I have this written as an operator, and this is a matrix. But I can also do, I can also flatten, and actually this really is the, I think in mathematics it really is a command flatten. I can flatten rho infinity to give a vector. So rather than write it as a matrix, I just write it as a vector. And then this L is now a matrix multiplying this vector. And so then I have just, I solve, I, and, I, and I solve this set of linear equations and I get, uh, I get a solution for what this vector is. So this is really just solving for the, for the set of linear equations. So that's one that will always work. But there are sometimes tricks that you can do. So another one, which is one that I picked up from the, the small, the first, uh, one of the first cases where this small thermal machine, the fridge, was constructed, was an elegant way of, I, I call it the operator method. It's not really called that, we just gave it this label. And what does this do? What you do um, when you look at a Limbladin like that is you say, well, if I think about the density matrix of this, what is it? So there are three qubits. That's eight, the Hilbert space of size eight. And so the density matrix has 64 terms. So in general, if I'm actually solving this equation as a set of linear equations, I'm solving six, uh, 64 of them. Okay, maybe slightly less. I use Hermitian, so I reduce it by half. But it's still a lot. But I also look at that and I say, well, actually, the number of things that are happening in this are very few. There's just three dissipators and an interaction Hamiltonian. So I, don't, I expect the solution that I get to actually be sparse in a sense. There's not going to be so many elements. And one of the ways of actually checking that is I go, well, let me find a set of operators that actually exist in the solution of this. And here's an easy way. So I, I think physically, well, before I turn the interaction Hamiltonian on, and also because of the effect of all of the dissipators, the state is going to be basically the thermal state of all of the three of them. So I can say, well, let me take, so start with something. So start with Let's, I, mean, I can actually start with arbitrary one, but for example, I can start with tau cold, tensor tau room, tensor tau hot, okay? And then I go, well, let me feed it into, the, into all of these operators of the Limbladin and see what I get. Um, and what you end up getting, because, so, so feed it into the Limbladin, and then what you end up getting is now you get new operators out of that. So one of the operators you get because of the interaction Hamiltonian, is you get this Y operator. Uh, it's called Y C R H, which is proportional to the following. So it's I one zero one zero one zero minus I zero one zero one zero one. Note that when I feed the thermal state into the dissipators, I'll just get zero because the thermal state satisfies the dissipators. All everything is thermal. But then, of course, okay, I have a new thing. And now I feed this into L. So feed this into the Limbladian, and I'm going to get something else. With this, I actually end up getting Z CRH. By the way, I use Y and Z not arbitrarily, but because they really are like, this is like the Pauli Y in that subspace. This is the Pauli Z in that subspace. So it's 101, 0, 1, 0, minus 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And then I repeat this, and yeah? Oh, what did I do? 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. D indeed. Thank you very much. 101, uh, 010. Zero, one, zero. Zero one zero. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Because when you feed when you feed um, tau into the interaction, it gives you the Pauli y. But then you feed y back into the interaction, it gives you back Pauli z. And then this, when you feed into L, it gives you the z operators. It gives you sort of reduced z operators um, with some thermal states. So you you end up getting things of the form tau c tensor tau r tensor z h, and this is really the Pauli z. Um, and like, well, et cetera, so you can permute where the z is. You also get things like tau c tensor z r h, which is the z operator where you, you take out c here, but it's still on r and h, so it's 0, 1, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, and of course, et cetera. And I think, yeah, and, that, and that's it, basically. So you, you get, you, as you do this process, you get more operators, but at some point, it stops. Basically, you get a set of operators where you feed anything in, you get another one of them. And now when you have this set of operators, this is nice because what you can then do, what you can then do is say, well, actually, let me write my rho infinity as a linear combination of this. So it's uh, sum over i, a i of these operators, let's call them ooh, capital AI. No, let's call this CI then. CI. AI, where AI is this set. And now what you're doing is you go back to the, oh, I solved the, a set of linear equations, but this is now with much less things. So I feed rho infinity into this, and because I've gone through this process, I know when I put AI into the Limbladen, I'm just going to get a linear combination of the rest of that set. And so now I have a set of linear equations again, but it's a very much reduced set. So in, for the case of the, um, the three qubit machine, so for the three qubit machine, you have that there are eight operators. One, three, four, five, six, seven, yes, eight operators. Let me count that I got them all. So one of them is the thermal state, one of them is the y operator, that's two, one of them is the z, that's the third one, and then you have three of these and three of these, which gives you nine, but then, ah, so it is nine operators, but then I think, well, you have one less degree of freedom because of normalization of the density matrix. So, in, uh, yeah, actually, so what you do see is that every one of the other operators that I have here, y, z, tau c tensor z, because they all, um, they all have the Pauli, or this one is just off diagonal, all of them are traceless. So actually the only one that has trace one is my original tau. So in fact, what you're going to get is that this for three qubits, so for the three qubit one, is going to be tau c tensor tau r tensor tau h, where this is just one, plus, and then you have coefficients attached to all of the rest. And when you look at the form of all of the rest, this is going to be a density matrix that basically it has some things in the diagonals, and there is one and only one off-diagonal element. Well, one, I, I mean one pair, of course, you need a pair. And this corresponds to the 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, zero, and that is the Hermitian conjugate. So that basically is the, the y one, because every one of the other operators are actually diagonal in, in terms of this. So you see the, the simplicity of the, thermal, um, of the thermal machine and the Limbladen sort of allows you to skip having to solve for everything, because if you, you basically, when you solve for everything, you're going to get a load of zeros in all of the rest of the places. OK. Is there any question? If not, uh, we can take a break here, and we can continue at 10.35. Yeah. Sorry, check. I mean, I can, it's part of the lecture, so I can answer the question anyway. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's basically this last argument. Yes. When we have this new definition of the operators, we can't feed in this set of operators uh, to each and all of the places. Yes. Mm -hmm. Y, and then I go to the specific other place. Yes. Uh, so there's a certain like hierarchy. Yes. And and then I was wondering, so then you could say the case is the same as the case. Of yes. The those higher end say uh, operators, and in this problem, for example, I could say that I need to feed that into Y. Yes.
Mm -hmm. That's my only negative about it. Like, mm -hmm. But you see, the problem is how it is basically in the same time. Like, I have one system or one part of the system that is always connected to the wire, and the other part of my system that is always connected to the wire. Or it's the other oh. system neglects the, 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 like, the temporal. So, the, so uh, okay, I see. So the, I, I, the temporal hierarchy is not. Um, to put it this way, this this method somehow is is mathematical rather than physical in the sense that so the starting point was I, I could for instance have started with an operator that even that was not going to be in the set I can I can start with an operator that, that corresponds to this element for instance um, and it would be fine because that would then take me into something in the set either that or it would take me to zero in which case I ignore it so the the point here is so for instance I could start with any one other one in this one and I would end up with the whole set in the end. The, the only thing that you're doing here is you're finding essentially, um, is it, uh, okay, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm sorry for what mathematical term I would use, but it's not kernel or something, but it's, it's sort of the conserved set under the Limbladian. It's like, oh, there's a set of operators which go into each other. Like yes, exactly, yeah. So it's an in, invariant, but it's invariant in the sense that you, you know, you get, you get coefficients and stuff when you do this, but indeed you always are in this subspace. Yeah, exactly. It is an invariant subspace. Any combination here, you stay in that subspace. Yeah, but for the invariant subspace, you don't mm -hmm. have this hierarchy. Indeed. And, and so the, the hierarchy only comes about from where you started. But you can start anywhere else, you'll get the same thing. So, that, so it is not really... So actually, the temporal hierarchy could be used if, for example, you wanted to say, well, I, I start my machine without the interaction Hamiltonian in which case I know it should be thermal because the only things that exist are the dissipator. I switch the interaction Hamiltonian on, and then I want to find what the evolution of the system is for small time. Then, then actually doing this order is good because then you'll be like the zeroth order term is this, the first order term will be this, the second, like every step will take you to a higher order in T. But this is of course only the small T expansion, and then of course in time you, you get all of the things mixed about. So in that sense, yes. Uh, but otherwise it's just a mathematical thing of getting the invariant subspace, yeah. Okay, ah, I still have space on this board. So let me continue uh, with this thing. So now, what is the steady state? So of course, I'm not going to do the full solving at the moment here, but I'm going to write it out. So I'm going to continue this, uh, this equation here. So let me now write it out once in full. Uh, there's a gamma. Okay. Have I used gamma there? Yes, I have. Okay, so I'm going to, just for this equation, because otherwise this might get very confusing, I'm going to use notation from a paper. So, from this paper, which is 2011, so. Uh, okay, and yes, well, I'm, you know, it's, and the reason is because they use gamma in a different way, and I just want to emphasize that I'm going to use that because otherwise writing this whole thing will be very difficult if I have to translate every term. So there's a Q23, Z1 tau 2 tau 3, tensor tau, oh. Do, 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 two, three, RCH, okay, yeah, two, tau, three. So the one, two, three is exactly the same as the um, C, R, and H that I've used. So that, that part is not actually different. Then you have the corresponding terms. So uh, Q, one, two, dot, 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 plus Q, one, three, dot, dot, dot. Um, okay, then you have the plus Q1, tau1, tensor Z23, and then the same thing, so plus Q2, dot, 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 plus Q3, dot, 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 and finally, the two terms of most interest, plus Z, Z123, plus Q over 2G, 2G, Y, 1, 2, 3. Okay? And the Y, yes, 
the coin flipped the correct way. I wrote the Y exactly the same way they did. And the Z is the opposite way. Okay, I mean, just it's a negative sign there, but it's fine. Okay. And okay, now I'm not gonna go through, so each of these, um, these little Qs and capital, uh, small Qs and capital Qs, they're all functions of the rate. So Q and capital Q, they all come from the dissipation rates, only the dissipation rates, okay? Um, G is exactly the same that I use, right? Yeah, so G is the, this is indeed good because G is the thing there. Um, but their gamma, and this is important, is equal to minus delta minus delta upon 2 plus q squared upon g squared. Ah, plus, well, q squared upon g squared plus dot dot dot. It has, has things with the capital Q and the other Qs. It's not anti commutative it's just that the terms are like that. And the most important part about this is that delta is equal to R1, R2, R3, R1, R2, R3, minus R1, R2, R3, and Rx is the ground state, the ground state population of the thermal state of X. So it's one upon one plus E to the minus beta X, Ex. R, oh, R bar is one minus, so Rx bar is one minus Rx. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Just one side note. When you have an equation like that, uh, and you start to do any calculations on, on this thing, and this comes from our discussion about what the regime of the Limblad is, one has to be careful to always make sure that you don't take limits on the solution that take you outside of the regime you as associated with in the first place. So for instance, I can't go, oh, let me take g to infinity, because that corresponds, in, corresponds to taking h into actually a very high value, or vice versa. So basically, every time you get a solution, you should al always go, this is a solution assuming certain things. So I have to always be careful not to apply the solution outside of the assumptions that I started with. OK, now. Yes, yeah, yeah, so whenever I write EX now without writing uh, delta E, I just mean E1 minus E0, so you always take, yeah, it's the energy gap. Okay, now. So, uh, the easiest way to look at this is sort of a shift away from the thermal state. Um, and the shift is, there are lots of constants, but it's proportional to one very important quantity, which is at R1, R2, R3 bar minus the, the latter thing. And this is kind of interesting because imagine how I wrote this. So I can write this out in full. Um, and what do I get? So in the denominator, I'm just going to get the product of the, so all of these one plus e to the minus beta is just the partition function of the qubit. And that's on both of them. So I'm just gonna have one upon Z, C, Z, R, Z, H. I'm gonna switch back to C, R, H now because we're getting to a good point. Um, and uh, as I said before, CR and H correspond to the 1, 2, and 3, so you don't have to worry about that. And the, uh, what do I have in the middle? So R1, R2 is bar, so I'm going to have E to the minus beta cold, E cold, uh, minus E to the minus beta room, E room, E to the minus beta hot, E hot. Okay, is this clear? Because the Rx bar is going to have e to the minus beta in the, num the numerator, so that's fine. Okay, um, now let me, let me actually just look at one interesting point. What if I take um, delta to be zero? So that would correspond to the fact that actually I, I just have my thermal state uh, as I like it in the beginning. So delta is equal to zero corresponds to beta c, beta c is equal to beta room, E, oh, yeah, no, wait.
No, something is something has gone. One and three. Yes, yeah, sorry. Two. Yeah, no, no. I, I didn't. I, two is. Yes. Uh, wait. What have I? What have I done? This is still Z C Z R Z H. The second one is R. Sorry. And this is C. Yeah. No. <laughs> so. One, two, three is C, R, and H. I'm sorry, that was a, that was a mistake, yeah. So beta room, E room is equal to beta cold, E cold, plus beta hot, E hot. Okay, so let me solve for beta cold, and I get beta cold is equal to beta room, E room, minus beta hot, E hot, upon E cold, okay? But I'm going to write this as E room minus E hot because we know that this is the case. It's E room minus E hot, okay? Now, why is this interesting? Let's go back to virtual qubits. When I looked at the room hot system, what did I get? So I had this four states. So this is zero, zero, room hot, zero, one, room hot, one, zero, room hot, and one, one, room hot. Room is the one with the larger energy gap, so zero, one is a smaller energy than one, zero. And this energy gap is the one that couples to the cold, so zero cold and one cold. They have the same energy, E room minus E hot. What is the virtual temperature of this one? So before I connect anything, I just go, oh, let room and hot be in the thermal state. What is the virtual temperature corresponding to this transition? Well, we've calculated this. Beta virtual is equal to beta room, well, it's basically equal to that. I'm not going to calculate it again because we have already done this here. So what I'm getting is that delta is going to be zero exactly when the cold qubit has the same temperature as the virtual temperature of this transition. Okay? Now, this makes sense on many levels. On the level of thermal machines, it makes sense. It's, um, what I'm basically saying is I connected a qubit at a particular temperature to a subspace, and it turns out that that subspace had the same temperature. So there's not going to be any heat flow. There's not going to be any flow at all, so nothing should happen. Um, a more mathematical linear algebra way of understanding this is if I have this case that um, this beta virtual is equal to that one, then what I'm going to get is that the populations of, so the population of P101 is going to be equal to the population of 0, 1, 0. Because, well, this, this is the same as saying P1 by P0 on the cold is equal to P10 on room hot upon P01 on room hot. And that's exactly what I'm saying with the, the equation of the virtual temperatures. And, and that means that this is, so the 0, 1, 0 and 1, uh, 1, 0, 1 and 0, 1, 0 space, uh, so the, the density matrix has, well, let me say the state the state in this one is proportional to identity. Because if the populations are the same, if I have two thermal states and I have two, well, that means it's already diagonal. And if they're two, um, if they're two populations that are the same, then in that subspace, it looks like the identity. Well, it's three thermal states. So of course, if I have an interaction Hamiltonian that's rotating around in that subspace, it's gonna do nothing because interaction Hamiltonian rotating on the identity, identity goes nowhere. So you also see why the interaction Hamiltonian will do nothing. And if the interaction Hamiltonian does nothing, then of course the rest just likes it to remain in the local thermal states. So, well, so this is an intuitive way to say that the action of a thermal machine is to take it away from the joint thermal state, but the how far you take it away is essentially given by how far the virtual temperature of the qubit that you constructed is from the one that is cold here. Is there any question? No? All right. So what happens when you... So the next thing is, okay, so now let's take delta not equal to zero. Then, of course, you're going to get that your, your steady state is not the thermal state. So one of the most important things to look at there, then, is what are the reduced states? So... And why is this important? Well, the whole point of this was to construct a fridge, right? So you're only going to get a fridge when you have managed to 
cool down the cold qubit to a temperature that's even colder than the bath it's connected to. So you want to see what is the state that I get at t is equal to infinity of the cold one. And now I can, just, I can just plug this into this thing and take the trace and all of the z and y operators are very nice to take the trace of. So you get this equation. So you have rho x is equal to tau x plus, and you have a perturbation, q gamma by, uh, again, this is the same notation that they use, so pi zi. Okay, so I can actually write. So their pi is the dissipation rate. So it's the gamma that I put in in the original equation. And their q is just the sum of the pi. So it's p cold plus p room plus p hot. Um, yeah, uh, and the gamma, of course, is the, is the full thing with, the, with all of the, the stuff. Now, the important thing with zi is it's, it's not just the Pauli z, right? So zi is what you get when you trace over two out of the three of these. So it's going to give you a different z. So it's going to give you the same z operator for c and h because when you trace out, um, so imagine that I was looking at zc. So let me write this here. So zc is where I trace out the rest. So I get minus 1, 1 plus 0, 0 on c. The same thing for zh. It's minus 1, 1 on h plus 0, 0 uh, on h. But z room is going to be different because when I trace them out, I get minus 0, 0 on room, yeah, plus 1, 1 on room. And this also makes sense because, of course, when you look at the thermal machine, you are extracting energy from cold and hot and putting it into the room. So the perturbation on the room state is going to be the opposite of what you get on the perturbation on the cold and, and other states. So every z is a perturbation of the populations either towards the ground state or the excited state. Okay. Okay. Uh, so... Good. Any questions? No? Okay, so now, 1052, so the final thing now we can talk about is the efficiency of such a machine, okay? Now this is really analogous to, at least the, the concept of efficiency I'm starting with is analogous to that that we do in classical thermodynamics. In every machine, we have somehow a source that is providing us with the, the thing that we we require to run the machine, and then we have a, a certain measure of how well it's going. So in the case of the fridge, our, let's say our source is the hot bath. Okay, so it's measured by Q hot. And I say Q hot because, uh, well, okay, I'm, I'm gonna check, I'm gonna use the formula again from the paper, so I'm gonna check whether they've used the Q as in the same direction I did. So up to minus sign. Um, and then the thing that measures how well you're doing in the case of the fridge is you have the, the, cold, the cold bath. The cooling on the cold bath is what you want. So that is QC. And so our efficiency of the fridge is going to be this ratio. It's the, it's the amount of heat that I managed to take out of the cold thing divided by the amount of heat that I have to put in from the hot bath. Okay, so QC upon QH. Okay. Now, uh, will I go to, yes, let's go to a new page. New board, rather. Oh, run out of space, otherwise. I don't need this one, right? No. I needed the Q, but I've already erased that. So let me write it again. Let me keep that just in case I need it. OK, so QC by QH. Um, OK, so now I'm going to put subscripts on this because Subscripts are superscripts, so 
this is this is both QC. Okay, in this case, it's fine. So it's QC out of the bath upon QH out of the bath. Yeah. So one always has to check signs. So what is QC out of the bath? QH out of the bath. So actually, before I write down the expression and prove it mathematically, I'm going to say something that is quite useful about these fridges. So the way that energy is transferred within the system, okay, so I'm not talking about energy between the qubits and the bath, but I'm talking about energy between the three qubits themselves, is very specific, right? The only way you can do it is when you have this triple excitation where E room goes down and EH, C, AH go up, or the other way around. What this means is that whenever there is energy flowing, and especially in the steady state where this, the state remains the same, you can expect that the energies have to be related by exactly this process. So if, if the cold bath gained a particular amount of energy, then I can calculate the number of excitations that, let's say, the, the, or the number of excitations the cold qubit had to lose to give the bath this energy. But exactly that same number of excitations must happen on R the opposite way and on H the same way because the only way heat flows or energy is transferred is via this interaction Hamiltonian. And so what we can already claim, and which it will become very apparent to see, is that QC by QH has to be EC over EH. Because the number of excitations that lead to QC and lead to EH are exactly the same on C and H. And the only thing you need more than the number of excitations is to multiply by the energy gap of that excitation. So that's the nice thing about having simple interaction Hamiltonians like this. You know that the ratio has to be the ratio EC divided by EH. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, and I mean, the easy way to see this is by saying, well, that, what is QC? I wrote this down earlier. This is going to be trace of, uh, so it's going to be, I'm going to use the annotation again. So PI, so uh, PC, trace of the Hamiltonian on C acting on, so it is the one that is out of, so it's going to be rho C minus tau C. Okay, so if it was if it was into the system, that would be the, the opposite, and that one is the one we would be used to. Write. I think that's the one I wrote down first. So the heat into the system, I take the final state of the system after dissipation, which is tau, and I subtract the initial state, which is again when I say rho c, this is a reduced state on c, um, and then I multiply it by the Hamiltonian, that gives me the yes. Uh, so you wrote the other way around. Yes. So when I first did it, so this is Q C. Um, Ah, out of the, I wanted out of the bath, into the bath. I wanted out of the bath, which is into the system. Yeah, okay, so actually I, I still want that one. Thanks. Yes, I wanted to. So this is out of bath. Yeah. Okay. Now, now I can use the, the reduced states. Where are they? They're there. So rho x is tau x plus this thing. And the nice thing about that is so the tau x is going to cancel. And I'm only going to be left with, also, the PI in the denominator is going to cancel because that's going to be PC. So I'm only going to be left with Q gamma um, trace of HC times that. So what is HC? HC is EC times 1, 1 on C. And this is traced with minus rho. So it's going to be negative of ZC. And ZC is that thing. So, okay, it's plus 1, 1, minus 0, 0. I hope that all of the, the signs have aligned in our favor. Um, yes, they have, because now at the end I have a positive thing. So, this is equal to Q, oh, sorry, Q gamma PC. Okay, because, yeah, when I trace this, only this thing is going to remain, and when I trace that, I get 1, so it's just easy. Any questions? The same way I'm going to get Q hot, I can do exactly the same way. It's going to be Q gamma E hot. And what I'm going to get for the last one, Q room, is going to be minus Q gamma E room for the simple reason that when I place the reduced state of room in, the Z has the opposite sign. So it's minus 0, 0, 1, 1, so it's going to be the thing. Um, and this, of course, gives me what I expect, because if I have the steady state, um, if I've gone long enough for the steady state, I know that my state of the system is not changing. So if I look at global energy conservation, I must have that the heat flows must balance out. And, and this is telling me that Q room plus Q 
C plus Q hot is equal to zero. Um, and the reason being that E room is equal to EC plus EH. So when I add this to these, it's going to cancel out. Okay, so energy conservation as expected. And it also gives me that QC over Q hot, as we said before, is EC over E hot. Okay? Now, Now, okay, now the question is, well, what is the maximum value that this thing can reach? So in classical thermodynamics, we know the maximum value that this can reach is the um, Carnot efficiency. So uh, let me call this eta. So in classical thermo, eta is less than eta Carnot. And eta Carnot for a fridge is, I uh, don't know it off the top of my head. Let me, there is a beta, let's, let me take a guess. No, let me not take a guess. Let me just write it. One minus T over TH, yes. So it's one minus TH, so beta hot by beta room, yes. Upon beta room. No, beta cold. Beta cold by beta room minus one. Or an easier, the way I usually remember it is beta room minus beta hot upon beta cold minus beta room. Either ways, yeah. I mean, okay, usually when you see it on, on Wiki or any other places, you usually have it in terms of temperatures, but every time you have a ratio with respect to beta, it's just the opposite with respect to temperatures. So that is eta Carnot, and yeah. So that's the maximum you can reach in classical thermal. So now, how do we find what is the maximum you can reach with eta here? Well, the point is that at the moment when you look at EC upon EH, there's nothing to say this cannot be anything we want. But we have one thing that we know. In order for this to act as a fridge, you must have, let's put it this way. So if it is a fridge, a successful fridge, then that means that QC should be greater than 0. So you need to have heat coming from the cold bath. And for QC to be greater than 0, it's the same as saying that gamma should be greater than zero, which is the same as saying that's where I needed that. And the other one, which or gamma is proportional to minus delta, okay, so which is minus delta greater than zero, which is the same as R1, R2, R3. Let me just write CRH. There's no point in confusing yourself. Should be greater than R C R R bar R H. And once again, I hope all of the minus signs align themselves in the correct way, because otherwise this will be awkward. Um, yes, so what is this condition? Now, I do the same thing as before. We, um, we write it down in full. The partition functions are there on both sides, so I can ignore them. And I'm just going to get e to the minus beta C E C e to the minus beta h, e h, is greater than e to the minus beta room, e room, which, when I take out the exponential, this thing still remains. Um, but, what I, yeah, but then I'm going to flip the sign. So I'm going to get beta c, e c, is less than beta room, e room, minus beta hot, e hot, and actually, I'm going to already take EC on the other side. That does not change the sign. And EC is ER minus EH, which, remember, was our beta virtual. OK? So again, this is very intuitive. This works as a fridge if beta C is less than beta virtual, which is saying that we generated a virtual qubit in our machine that had a temperature that was colder than that of the cold qubit. So because it's colder, it's going to extract heat from the cold qubit. So this is also very intuitive and consistent with our, our understanding. Um, OK, so now all that remains is to say, well, if beta C is less than this, then we can get something on that. So what do we say? EC over EH. Aha, OK. So now what I do is I take the same equation, but I write ER equals EC plus EH. Um, and so let's use that board now. That part of the board, I don't need delta anymore. OK. 
Do I need to do this in full? All right, let's do it. <laughs> so beta C, let me start with the previous version. So beta C E C is less than beta room R room, but that's beta room E C plus beta room E hot minus beta hot E hot. Oh, that's quite simple, actually. So then we collect E C here, beta cold minus beta hot. And on the other side, we collect E hot. E hot, oh, sorry, there's a less than, I'll keep the da -da -da, less than, less than e, to, e hot times beta room minus beta hot. And from that, we get E C upon E hot, which is equal to eta, is less than, big surprise, the same thing. Yeah, no, I, that was that was EC, and I kept it as EC now. So this is this is still EC. So I, I I go back to C because I don't want R anymore. I only want um, I only want E. It's uh, I only want the cold and the hot one. So E cold minus E hot. What have I done? EC beta room. Ah, beta C minus beta room. Yeah, sorry. When I took it on that side, I made it a beta hot for no reason. Beta C minus beta room, which is actually eta. Carnot from the classical thing. Okay, so it's kind of neat what we get is that we end up getting the, the same Carnot efficiency as the classical case. Okay, so I mean a lot of little calculations, but essentially the 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 main part now is to is to combine sort of the simplistic intuition and to see sort of the simplistic intuition that comes out of this. So we have beta v, and if beta v is greater than beta C, which is the same as saying TV is less than TC, then you get a fridge. And this is also this is very intuitive. It just means that, ah, you generated a machine that was actually colder than the thing that you connected it to, so it's going to extract energy. Um, and beta V equal to beta C is sort of the Carnot point. So it's the point at which nothing happens. So remember, when we take beta v equals to beta c, then we get that the steady state is just all of the thermal states. But it's also the point of maximum efficiency from this argument. So this is actually very much like classical thermal. As the fridge goes further away from the Carnot point, you actually have that it will work faster and faster because the, all of the heat flows and everything are proportional to this gamma, which in turn is proportional to the delta that we had, which, yeah, so the gamma is proportional to delta. And delta is a proportional to this difference. So you work faster and faster. But as you work faster and faster, you go away from the point of max efficiency. And so the maximum efficiency is also the, the point of reversibility. Okay. Um, and the, so, so this, is both in, this is interesting because here, what we have ended up doing, in a sense, is we've constructed arguably the simplest thermal machine. I say we, I mean the researchers that did this constructed it, and we have now gone through the construction. But what we are considered here is arguably the smallest one, because really, for each of the three temperatures, we have the simplest possible system. But we managed to do it, and it is a machine that demonstrates all of the, the structure that you expect from a classical thermal machine. It has the Carnot point, the Carnot efficiency, and the temperatures, and so on and so forth. Uh, it also makes an interesting point, which is that now if I imagine a co more complicated system with many energy levels, what we can see is that whenever we have a connection, whether we can reach Carnot efficiency is, depends on whether the energy gaps of the connection are well matched. So this is guaranteed for us in the three qubit fridge because there's only one way to connect. So there's only one Carnot point. But if I had, so for example, instead of qubits, I had qtrits, and you know the top levels were connected, the bottom levels were connected, and they had different energy ratios, the top and bottom, then I could never reach Carnot efficiency because one of them would have a different Carnot point to the other. So in fact, small it's almost a statement that when you have a continuous thermal machine such as this one, you can only reach Carnot efficiency when you have the simplest possible connections because more, you could easily with higher level systems if you connect everything, it's very easy to have connections that will have different Carnot points and then when you have a mixture, you, you cannot satisfy all of the conditions the same, the same way. Um, this is not a problem in a lot of classical machines because they are also machines that work in cycles. So what we have considered here is a machine that works continuously. So there's no... There's no Carnot cycle. It's not that we did you know, something isothermal and then isoadiabatic or so. We just have something that's continuously working. If you have a cycle, then you can reach a Carnot efficiency because you do it over the sum of a cycle, whereas each step is 
somehow separate. Um, okay, that was a bit hand wavy, but just a bit of intuition on the count efficiency of the of the small thermal machines. Um, we have nine minutes more. So in those nine minutes, actually, are there any questions? No? Okay, so what I wanted to do in the remaining time that we have is just go through, let's see how many we get through, generalizations of what we've just done. Okay? So one of the generalizations, actually one of the things that you will do in the lecture, uh, sorry, in the tutorial, is to consider an even simpler thermal machine, one that has just two qubits, each connected to a thermal bath. And the goal of that thermal machine is not actually heat flow. Uh, because, OK, if you just have two qubits each connected to a thermal bath, then the heat flow is just going to be from the hotter to the colder one. But the goal there is entanglement. The reason is, I have erased this now, but um, when, I, when I talked about the density matrix that you get in the steady state, it had this one off diagonal term. And that one off diagonal term was between 1, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0. So this, if you look at this term, this is like a, this is a three qubit term. It's really, it's a correlation between the state of all three qubits, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And it turns out then that you can look now for different values of the parameters. So when you can change gamma and you can change G, you can look at the steady state that you get and you can ask the question, well, is this steady state entangled? So is the correlation high enough that actually this is a quantum steady state I would not get classical? Uh, and, and it does exist, there do exist parameters for which it is entangled, but you can do something even better when you just have two systems. So you just have a cold qubit, a hot qubit. And now, as I said, the heat flow is not so interesting. It's always hot to cold. But what's interesting is that you can generate a steady state that has entanglement, it has correlation. So this is something that you will do in the, um, in the tutorial. Let's consider the other thermal machines of interest. So. So probably not going to get through all of the generalizations, but that will continue tomorrow. So the first generalization is heat pumps and engines. So this is now just what is the thermal machine that we're constructing. So the thermal machine that we constructed was in order to extract heat from one of the systems. What if we want to dump heat into a system? Then what do we do? So then, so actually heat pumps and engine, they both construct the same way. So when I'm constructing a machine, all I have to think about is, well, my component that has to gain or lose energy, um, the component that I, I want to basically construct the interaction that matters to me. So in a heat pump, what I would have is, I would have a source of heat here. Uh, no, so let's put it this way. This is my heat pump, and then it. So if I have, what is the goal? And the goal is to. So I have some hot bath here. I have a room temperature bath here, and I want to generate Q into this third system, so I'm not going to call, I'm just going to call this A, for example. So I'm going to use a heat flow from hot to room to drive heat into A. And this picture already gives me what my, so if I'm constructing a three qubit machine, what it should be, because I can see heat is flowing from hot and it's flowing into room and into A. So that immediately tells me my biggest system is going to be connected to hot. And then I have the system of interest, so this is A, so it's, I'll just call this A. And then I have my third system, which is connected to room. Okay, and now I can do exactly the same thing that we, we did before. I make an interaction Hamiltonian that is energy preserving. I write down dissipators for each of these things. I calculate the steady state. And just like in that case, I will have that, if I look at when this, is, this works successfully as a heat pump, it will only work successfully as a heat pump when the virtual temperature that's generated by hot and room, so the virtual temperature by these two, 
is hotter than the virtual temperature of A. So basically, in this case, I will get beta hot E hot minus beta room E room. And this is, this is the, well, this divided by E hot minus E room. That's the virtual temperature of these things. Has to be, because it has to be hotter, it has to be less than the virtual temperature of A, so beta A, for example. And then I will get this. So, but you see the, the intuitive way of doing it is you go, well, I construct the, you know, the usual classical way of looking at the machine. I see where the heat is going into and out of, and that gives me which has to be the bigger system, which has to be the smaller ones, and the rest goes. And the Carnot point and everything, this will also correspond to the Carnot point. If I put an equality here, I will have maximum efficiency and so on and so forth. Engines are a special case of this. Now, in the case of an engine, I want to extract work. So it's not just a case of heating this up. And when I want to extract work, um, work is typically something that we consider to be an indefinite amount of storage. So you know, if I say, ah, I'm raising a weight, uh, it's different from raising a qubit, because I can only raise a qubit up to its excited state. But when I raise a weight, I have more and more that I can do. So in the case of engines, the usual thing to do is to consider your third system not to be a qubit, but a work storage system. So the easiest version of this is a ladder. So for an engine, you would go, so I still have a system A, so I, so I have my E hot. So this was beta hot. I have, let's write it this way. So this is connected to room. But what I connect it to instead of a qubit, I connect it to a ladder. Okay, and as before, I choose the spacing the spacing in the ladder to be E hot minus E room. And what this allows me to do is it, it allows me to write an interaction Hamiltonian just the way I used to do it there. But now, of course, it's just instead of just raising there, you, you go up. So this will be 1, 0. So if you're here, here, and n would go to 0, 1. So this one goes down, that one goes up, and that one goes up, so n plus 1. So OK, I can do this just in case it gets confusing, plus the Hermitian conjugate, and then I sum over n. So it, in principle, it's, it's really the same, but now it's not just acting on that one. It's just raising or lowering everything, so on and so forth. Now, here you don't have a steady state. But what you do have is an asymptotic so asymptotic um, current and, uh, let's say, precision. So when you calculate the rate, like the Limbladion on this, of course, it's not going to be a steady state because you will keep moving up or down, actually fluctuating. Um, so you're not going to get a steady state. But what you can do is you can calculate in the, in the long-term limit what the rate of going up is, what the rate of spreading is, and so on and so forth. So you get sort of asymptotic... Uh, things for that. Um, but again, here as well, the, the same thing with the Carnot point uh, um, works. So in order for you to move on average up the ladder rather than down the ladder, you have to have that the virtual qubit that you, you construct here must have greater population in the higher state than in the lesser state. So that basically means the virtual qubit has to be less than 0. So you only have an engine if beta virtual, which is this thing, beta hot E hot minus beta room E room upon E hot minus E room is less than 0. OK? And so the final thing to leave you with, so this is heat pumps, this is engines. The final thing to leave you with is that, well, you can take all of this that we've written on qubits. Oh, this is now dying. And you can take it to oscillators. So for example, your H room now would be your usual harmonic oscillator thing. So you have uh, A dagger room A plus half or whatever it is, or proportional to uh, an omega room, where omega is the gap. And then your H interaction, I'm, I'm now doing it again for the fridge. Your H interaction has to be, again, an energy-preserving interaction. So it's of the same form. You just replace the jumps by daggers, uh, by the ladder operators. So in this case, you would be A room, A, uh, sorry, A, C, R, H. So C 
R dagger A hot plus the Hermitian conjugate, so A dagger C A R A H dagger. And of course, with a G. And now you can do all of this. So in fact, the literature and thermal machines, these ones would appear before that, I think, the, the things with harmonic oscillators. And so, yeah, and they will work the same way as well. Um, and so the, actually, the, the whole point of doing this is if you open uh, literature on thermal machines, you will find a lot of times that somebody might write it, for example, as, oh, I suggest we make a thermal machine on, let's say, a superconducting qubit or make a thermal machine on a quantum dot. And they might look very different. But the key, once you understand all of this, is you can go, well, let me look at this and look at the abstract thing. Like, what is the source? What is the sink? What is the sort of virtual qubit that has been made by the connections in between the thing? What is the effective interaction Hamiltonian? And you sort of extract something that is a constant presence in all of thermal machines. And then, of course, you have the... the extra things from the actual uh, physical device you're using. OK, um, so we'll consider more playing around with more with virtual qubits and thermal machines tomorrow uh, in preparation for Patrick. I think this is all you need for Patrick's lecture next week. Uh, and with that, I yeah answer a question yeah, and leave you. Question. Yes. Yes. So for the no, two qubits, as in, but yeah, ah, for the for this engine. You can use yeah, so you can use a mixture of qubits and that, but that's also fine. So in in that case, you instead of so basically, it is a for for that, and it's sigma plus and sigma minus for qubits, where sigma plus is just 1, 0, and sigma minus is 0, 1. So for example, you basically use sigma or A depending on what your system is. So our old Hamiltonian was really sigma plus on C, sigma minus on R, sigma plus on H, plus the initial conjugate. And now you, you, they are basically of the same form. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, it it no, it it doesn't. It it's not really a problem. So, um, yeah, it, it's fine to have uh, thermal machines where this is an oscillator. So, because as long as the these temperatures are positive, it's fine. You have population and everything, but it's a thermal state, so it decays as you you go upwards. So it's still a well-defined state and everything. So you can find the the thing is on the if you construct an engine on an oscillator, as in this case, you're never going to have a steady state because if beta v is negative, it means you keep pushing population higher and higher. But it's fine to have h and r also be oscillators. That's that's completely fine. Uh, uh, the only thing I would actually mention at the end is you don't have a reset reset master equations don't make um, sense for oscillators. There you really have to use jump operators. So typically there your dissipator is sorry I forgot this your dissipator is of the form. So you, you, you have jump operators. So you have that you you have gamma plus with a dagger is the raising operator. A dagger rho a well and minus half the thingy and then plus gamma minus the other thingy. So a rho a dagger minus half the anti commutator. So this is the typical way of writing the dissipator in the harmonic oscillator case. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, well, the, the, the thing with the harmonic state is because all of the gaps are the same, yeah. you still have the, the virtual qubit. So basically every time, there is essentially an infinite number of virtual qubits in both of them, but they all connect to exactly the same way because the gaps are the same and stuff. So, yes, exactly, the, the, yeah, the regularity of the energy gaps, yes, indeed. So indeed, once you have gaps that are not the same, then you start getting, then it becomes more complicated. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.